I'm the moderator for the manufacturing track. Welcome everybody, appreciate you taking your time uh, to hear from a couple of our speakers today. I'd like to uh, introduce David Coleman. He is a finance business partner and continuous improvement manager at Goodyear. Uh, he's been involved in numerous cultural transformation efforts with his most recent being a four year journey to turn a broken plant into a Starship Award recipient by demonstrating lean manufacturing principles and world class safety that is recognized by the Association of Manufacturing Excellence. He's here today to talk to us about culture transformation in manufacturing enterprise, uh, specifically focusing on the importance of culture and why does it tr trump intelligence, how culture impacts decision making, and then give us a little bit of sharing of case studies to uh, highlight how culture overrides intelligence. So with that, David, please take us through. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, in all the other presentations I've seen, it's, it's, this one's going to be a, a little bit different. Uh, it's more the fairy tale version. I'm going to move quick. Um, you know how people said they took slides out? I didn't. So we're going to move very fast through these, but I'm going to bookend this with uh, where we were at the beginning of the journey, and um, I'm going to let our associates speak on a slide at the end, um, and uh, hopefully you'll get a good taste for what we went through and just evidence of uh, what we feel could be replicated anywhere. Um, it, if you start with culture, it enables all the other tools to be used. So I want to start with a safety uh, message. We want to create um, a safe and accountable environment. You have to care. So I'm going to talk to you kind of like we talked to our employees when we when we were in our journey. So you got to picture yourself as the group, and I'm going to tell you the setting in a minute. But today, uh, our message is create a safe and envi accountable environment. And that's not safe just safety-wise. Your body gets hurt. We're talking about emotional safety, intelligence, um, regardless of what your size, what your capacity levels are that you would feel safe in the environment that, that you work in and that you would enable people to be as uh, creative and as energetic and as valuable as they're capable of being without having some type of discernment or discrimination or loss of emotional uh, energy. So that's what we want to get to in our environment at, at our plant. Uh, we are um, race manufacturing for good years. I'm in the division that does the NASCAR tires. We have exclusive contract with NASCAR. Every, every NASCAR car that goes out there around that track has our tire on it. We do NHRA, the drag tire. We call our tire an engineering marvel. That tire can do that uh, on eight different races. We also brand the Goodyear name. We, we tour thousands of visitors to our plant now. We have created an environment in our facility right next to our headquarters that is very attractive for everybody from investment bankers to Chrysler and Toyota and whoever the customers are to, um, you know, uh, friends of our CEO. Three common characteristics I want to talk to you about or just mention to you that I've experienced in four transformations that I've been a leader of. One is autonomy. You, will, you, can, drive, you can drive an organization to a higher level, but just from the autonomous level of people that actually believe it and actually support it. Um, the other thing that seems common about all four is it's like a cult. People will say, this feels like a cult. It's like the Stepford Wives. You know, everybody seems to be like really good here for some reason. <coughs> and the other one is, what happens with upper management after you get into this and you're successful and they really want <coughs> a part of it, they ask, what in the world did you do there? And can you do it again? We started in this type of environment. I would come through sometimes a facility and would see a guy unchain his chair in the morning and he would chain it. <coughs> and that, that is not an uncommon sight uh, that was in our plant. So that's where our story begins. It was not in good shape. The chair was there. The business history uh, began. We're a hundred year old facility within Goodyear. The union is the local number two to just uh, USW, United Steelworkers, and to give you an idea of how uh, tough that union is, there is no local one. So that is one of the oldest locals in the nation and one of the strongest ones that we were contending with um, at the time we started our journey. 
supplier of NASCAR tires for 66 years. So we're not only an old company, we have old customers. We have customers that are 100 years old, have been our customers. Recent history, five manufacturing directors, five years declining volume, worst good year worldwide safety. So when you looked at a safety chart in good year and you saw 60 plants, it didn't show the other thousand locations of Goodyear because they're like the retail centers where nobody gets hurt. The 60 plants, you look down the bar charts and all the way, and there were, that's, that was us when we started the journey, the last on the list. Poor relationship with union leaders, we were called broken. More background, three to one ratio of chairs to associates. Of course, they had to change the <coughs> one chair they did use. Uh, committee fights and safety, constant fights. I walked in, I was put on the safety chair at the beginning, and it was, it was just a fight every meeting. Poor housekeeping, upkeep, proud, unengaged, resistant workforce. So their pride, they've been, some people have been there 40 years. They were proud, but they were proud to resist you as a union. Uh, excluded from corporate operational performance initiatives. We had no consultants while the company was spending $100 million on consultants. We were, we were not the mainstream plant, so we weren't given any help. No expectations, uh, passionate or silent or negative. It, it, was, it, was, it was at times worse than having a fight. They would just basically say, we have no expectations of you. you. You won't be here in six months, just like all the other managers. Um, so it was a very uh, no trust environment. So here we are in NASCAR, the glamorous uh, business that gets, uh, you know, the, the race drivers coming in to visit you, the owner of NASCAR <coughs> to visit you, and all these glamorous things we get involved in. And uh, we had the chair. So behind the scenes was the reality. Uh, up front, you saw a lot of glamour on television and millions of fans. So my mindset coming in, just a little personal thing, I had done three transformations. The guy that was pulling me over to the race business, I had been a director of manufacturing, went back and forth between finance and, and operations. Uh, just came off of a finance role as a North America um, um, director of finance for North American plants, for financial planning and analysis. And the guy, my boss was getting moved over into the race businesses to head up this whole thing. And he had never run, he'd never been in manufacturing. So he, I said, well, I'll come over, but I'm not coming to be miserable for first, because I know you don't have to be. And two, I'm not coming to count brass hammers. I'm a finance guy, but I'm not coming here to count all the dollars. So, um, so our starting point is pretty bad. And another just point to mention is, in, in this environment, a union president would not stand up here with for fear that he'd be associated with management. So it was a very bad environment. So we started thinking, it was primarily the, the, this manager and I, we started thinking, said, well, why can't we be the plant to work, best place to work, plant, plant of choice, um, demonstrate best practices, brand the good your name better, why can't we be united with our USW? So that was our vision. We just kept, we started thinking about it. So we built a case for change with the roadmap, the principles, management systems, gap analysis. I told you I'm going to move through this quick so you, you don't have to memorize anything. You know, the, like the Snow White story. You probably don't know a lot of the details, but you do know how it ended, right? You still remember that. Okay. So um, here's a, here is a thing. They, they asked me to start leading in some of the cultural stuff. And so here's a model I built. And I'm going to go through this real quick. This was my first presentation to the salary team. I said, okay, so th this, this thing down the middle here represents like a five-year journey. But at the beginning of the journey, we said, hey, we had to really get in the mindset of our people, our managers, our hourly people, everybody in the organization. We said, so cultural mindset, what does it look like, feel like, sound like, what does it need? First thing, we said it needs safety. And we did. We really <coughs> focused on safety first. You hear that as a cliche sometimes. But we really focused and committed to it. So then we said, okay, you know, we got this background of pre-awareness, awareness, awareness uh, understanding, you've seen this as sometimes as measuring your cultural maturity, so we did too. And then we said, uh, and then you got to change eventually. So then we said, hey, you know, in the beginning of the journey, you got some good things and some bad things. At some point, you have to make a decision. When you do, there's a can of worms. Matter of fact, the union president's going to swim in and tell you in the contract you can't do something. Then we said, you know, after you get to one side, how do you envision the future? We said, hey, we're always going to have problems. So don't sit and think we're going to eliminate all our problems, but we're going to make them smaller and we're going to make our, our, our um, capabilities stronger. So then we said, okay, what is it going to, what's it feel like? Well, today, it felt like a bunch of resistance. And sometimes you don't know what it is. You're trying to launch things, trying to do things, you just can't get things to move, you can't get them to stick. 
Well, people have been here a long time. They work on what? Intuition. And uh, they, they, do, they have the tribal knowledge. And we're trying to get capabilities and engagement. So we try to paint a picture for what it would feel like. And then we come down and said, OK, you know, you got to choose your comfort zone. People have to learn to feel differently about change. They have to learn to feel differently. That I can feel bad about being a bad batter in, in, in baseball. And I can feel the struggle of learning to be better. So I got to choose my, my uncomfort. Where, where's my uncomfort going to be? So we kind of tried to get that across to them, talked about storming, norming, um, forming, and the emotions you're going to feel. We also said, OK, what's it sound like? In our organization, it was sounded like this. What tools? We have social issues. If you've ever been in a union environment, social issues is a big word, right? So social issues, people don't need to know. We've tried this before. You guys won't be here. We said, no, we need to hear different things. We need to say, we want people to say, we want to work here. This is the best place to work. This is a great place. Well, matter of fact, our CEO, after we got all you know, three years into our journey, said in front of the 60 highest good year people, you need to go to that plan. Before, he used to say, I don't like going to that. Now he was telling everybody to go to the plant and tell them to invest money in our plant, you know, our, our, our vice president of manufacturing. So when, when we said then, so we get to what it sounds like and say, what does it need? We said, it needs a cultural foundation. You know, not just safety, but we need respect, strategy, communication. And just like we've been talking about in a lot of these sessions, you've got to get the tools. But, you, but you know, our point was, in the culture, before you get, before you get the tools, you've got to get into the, into the mindset of people and change the way they think so that you enable the fact that they're going to use tools. So what I closed that uh, session with was, you know, we have a place where we think we are, but there is actually where you really are. And then we said, you know, our, our journey started here to find a path. And our commitment to be honest and have a lot of fortitude to drive through this. So we stepped out on the limb as a, as, a, as a management team. And then they said, hey, why don't you teach Culture 101? We had an ICM university we kind of turned it. I said, OK. So Culture 101 we started with, I didn't even know what a culture was totally. I had to go and Google it. So you get all these definitions of culture. And uh, you know, the one thing we wanted to find within it was where did intelligence play into it? You know, there's, there is a, there's an intelligence, and there's a culture, and there, maybe there's a combination of all of them. But basically, it's a, we are a culture right here. It, if I, and people like to point and say, like, hey, the culture. The management's like say, well, that's a terrible culture. Well, you're in the culture. You can't call it. You can't call it something like it's this foreign object. You have to. You have to embrace the culture and take ownership. And that's what we did as a management team. Ownership for all the cultural issues that have ever been managed for the hundred <coughs> in that plan. So there was a quote uh, years ago by Commodore Perry, and he said, uh, "Dear General, we've met the enemy, and they are ours." And he's dragging the enemy boats up the river. That was actually misquoted here in the Pogo cartoon. It said, we've met the enemy, and he is us. And that's how we felt as managers. We met the enemy, it's us. We have full responsibility for changing this culture and the business. So then we said, well, culture, you know, knowledge doesn't make the best decisions. So in, in the culture and knowledge relationship, and you hear this, you know, and, and I've got it in part of my, um, you know, um, bio thing, is culture trumps intelligence. So a real quick example, I was in wrestling in college, and before I got to this school, it was a Division II college school. When I got there, it was Division I. But on its way to a Division I school, it was a Division II school. And years ago, you used to be able to wrestle in Division I if you won the Division II national championships. But nobody would ever win the Division I national championship, even though you were a Division II champion. Well, there was a guy named Gary Barton, and he was on, um, Coach Bub was the coach at Clary University. He had a 50% winning record in D2. He qualified for D1. He comes off the match, and he says, hey, coach, after one win in the Division I National Championships, and he says, hey, coach, I think I can win this term. And my coach says, I did what all great leaders would do. I told him, I think you can too. I lied. And lo and behold, the guy won the National Championship. So when you talk about culture and how you support your employees and what the facts are behind it, we got to be different. Now, I'll give you another example. So I had a Menza boss. You guys know who Menza is, right? Very smart guy, smartest guy I ever worked for. Great intellect in the company, been in the company for years. But he was the president of a joint venture, and I was the CFO. And so we're sitting there looking at data on prototypes coming through the, the, the system. We put prototypes out in the field for transmissions, heavy duty transmissions. And he stamped his hand on the, on the <coughs> table after seven of the ten prototypes failed. 
And he said, his, his culture that he, he had grown up through, we don't miss deadlines. It was just like the space shuttle. We don't miss deadlines. Okay, what happened? Well, he pulls the chief engineer, puts the pressure on him. Chief engineer says, well, we can, we can launch and fix as we go. <clears throat> Didn't have a solution. $50 million of warranty problems later, we shut the division down. So when we talk about intelligence, nobody was smarter than this guy. But he just had, he, he had a cultural flaw. So we kind of said, hey, we also want to continue some improvement culture. Regardless of what we say, you've got you to get better. You can't just do culture for the culture, you know, just to say the culture. So we said, simple, point A to point B. I'm going to follow back up on this slide in a few minutes. We said we wanted you to, to open up your eyes. I said, you know, in my safety message, you talk about, um, you know, uh, using all your skills of all the people. We said, hey, there's colors. There's one color. There's a lot of colors. There's a lot of sounds, a lot of words. We want to write our own book. So we were feeding our people. You know, encouraging things on the culture. Don't discriminate. Use all the tools. Let's make this thing something special. And here we were, the worst in the plant or in the company. So we also said, think about the way you think. So you know, there's great critics and then there are great speech writers and, and, and motivators. And we said, so you need to think like that too. You got to all be motivators and think how you affect other people every time you do something. So we said, think small. Think about the individual. You can overstimulate and understimulate. There's a science experiment that a lot of us went through in, in school where you, you know, the paramecium, and, you, and you, it, it, it'll, it'll die if you overstimulate, it dies if you understimulate. We said, think bigger though, also think about the whole system. So individuals matter and systems matter. We heard this morning about, you know, where do you start? You start with yourself, but, but it's all about the system. So we said the culture becomes a team when uh, their core beliefs. You got a core value, a core mission. So we said, you know, you want, do we want to bring our best 300 people or maybe not? Maybe we want our 300 best people. There's a big difference between that and the way you manage. So we, we filled them up with a lot of philosophies and um, tried to really encourage them to think differently and take, take more of everybody being a leader. So said, so what's our discomfort strategy? How do you lead people? You know, um, do you yell at them? Do you hurt them like cats? Do you just send them in a maze? said, no, and, and when you pick your discomfort, why don't we pick a discomfort that actually gets us ahead instead of just get something done or accomplishes something in the short term? We've talked about different cultures um, that we have to deal with, not just with our customers, but even within our business. So, you know, I always tell the story. We, we were negotiating a deal on port, very complicated port um, in a, in a, for a transmission with the Koreans. And different cultures have different ways of, of being polite and saving face in the way they do something. They were giving us a quote on a part, and we knew they couldn't hit it. Too complicated. The cost, they could never hit the cost. But as the story went on, we said, well, they, they knew we knew they couldn't hit it, and we knew they knew they couldn't hit it, and they knew we knew they couldn't hit it. The thing went on forever. Like, but the point was is, you know, they did raise the price later. So understanding the cultures doesn't necessarily a bad thing that you have differences, but you do, you know, sometimes it's actually humorous sometimes to work through it. So, we said, hey, you know, there's uh, common mistakes, and we said we've got to bust myths. And so we did. We showed an example where, you know, there was something we were doing in our company that we had five myths, six myths that, 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 that went along with this. And if you sat down with your employees and talked to them and sat down with your customer and talked to them and sat down with, you know, the leadership, you found out every single one of those myths was wrong. And why are we still doing this process? And so it enabled about a million dollar savings. So we use that as an example to show. You know, you got to use tools and you got to use problem solving and think through uh, your culture. So we said, you know, it is how you do it, not just what you do. And so, you know, the concept was build the foundation. Continue to build. Once you, once you get that, don't backslide. If you, if, you, if you make a change, you know, how you treated the person, the process you used, what you learned through that, you, you need to keep growing your organization. So we talk about that. And then we talk about all encounters matter. Every single thing you do every single day, you put on one side of the scale or the other. When it comes to the culture, everything matters. So we put a, we've had a, on our, our employee boards, we started making boards for our employees in each of the areas. And we would put one good thing about that employee on the board with you know, their, their picture and their name and their years of service. 
So, we were very specific and very personal as a management team when we started. And we said, we want you to change. My son went to Naval Academy. And, and, and there's a very high clientele of kids who go to Naval Academy. But when you go in there, they, they, they pull you in. And those, that commandant in the, in, the, in the orientation session is telling you, I'm going to change your kid. Everybody's bringing a kid in there thinking their kid, their kid's like top notch, right? No, he's, he's ours now, and he will change. And so, you know, I came up with this as I was talking about it. I saw this on the internet and said, hey, this is perfect. This is evolution. It changed. It's good. You know, everybody changed. You know, like, it's, and then I said, nah, that's not it. Because if I show that, then people are changing and adapting, right? And we're saying, no, we're bad managers. And, and sometimes there's really bad managers, and we don't want you just to adapt and change to a bad manager. We want to, we want to change that manager. So don't adapt there. Make, make your changes intentional. Let's create our own destiny. Let's decide how we want to change, and then go change. So we come up with this model. This is our, this is our salary um, uh, manufactured model. And we said, yeah, this is motherhood, not apply. Who could disagree with this model here? Customer obsessed, value driven, safe. And I'll get to that one too later in a follow up as to how we validated that model. So, in the third year and fourth year of the journey, our uh, leadership they, they started getting a little attention towards us because we were being successful in some things. So, they, they asked us to go for Shingo or AME Awards, the Association of Manufacturing Excellence. We said no. They also asked us if we wanted now to have some of the consultants. And we said, no, we think we have a good thing going here. We think we know what we need to do. We just got to keep being committed to it and do it. So, but we were measuring ourselves about right here still. We were barely, we were like a 1.9 out of a, a, a 5 on, on the scale. So they said, let's do Culture 201. That kind of migrated into that. And the Culture 201 became point A to point B. Same thing, but then something changed. We said, you know, point A to point B, that was our old, um, here we are, and we said, there, there's our, our new curve now. And well, why is that the new curve? Well, we're not where we were before, is one. And we're not where we, we're, we're where we want to be changed. So our conclusion through the whole thing said, we got to navigate. We have to be committed to navigate. It's not, you know, when you talk about 70% planning and then you just execute, it's, it's like, that. yes, if you counted all the times you planned over the whole course of your, of your executions, it might be 70%, but you can't do all 70 up front because you don't even know where you're going yet. So an example of that kind of sort of is when I grew up, I was from a divorced family, and I was probably one of the only people I knew in a divorced family. So I was a minority. I mean, truly a minority in the you know, blue-collar suburbs of Pittsburgh. I was, te I was talking in front of a group of um, kids from the Boys Girls Club, and they're on the privileged children, and I, we were telling our stories, and I, you know, you could be really good and everything. And then I said, I thought I was going to really connect with her. And I said, how many of you are from a divorced family? Not one kid raised their hand. Why is that? Anybody know? Because none of them were married. Huh? Households today, 40-some percent of the households are married. When I grew up, it was 87. So Jeff Bezos talks about, you know, today, in, in today's world, if you upset somebody in today's world, they're telling 6,000 friends and through the internet. Years ago, they told their four best friends. Right? So, so you got to be careful, and things change so quickly in the cultural part of your business that you just got to keep navigating. you got to be more aware of it. So we talk about each kind, you know, there's a statistics on uh, every country feeling culture is important. It's a, it's a worldwide thing. We talk about our decision making, like especially in safety. 67% of, of, of errors in safety are actually made above the front line. So when we talk about our employees and how we talk to them, and well, how did you get hurt? Right? Why did you get hurt? Right? So any emphasis on that, like it's his fault, 67% of the times it's, it's who bought the equipment, how the equipment was guarded, how the, how the plant was designed, how the processes were designed. It had nothing to do with that employee. He just spent 40 years avoiding the accident that he finally had. You know, so we, change, we were changing our mindsets as managers constantly throughout that. And this is another uh, a graph that, or chart that illustrates that, a cross belt chart that talks about years ahead of accidents are the real decisions made to create them. So we also talk very personable. 
to our employees about the way you behave. Now, in our union contract, there is actually a clause in there that says that our union employees are allowed to swear at management. Now, think of that management style that created that. And then high-level executives in the organization sign those contracts. So what are they telling the employees? So we had the chair, and then we went to the improvements. Our plant, we started cleaning up. We created a center of excellence. We cleaned every conference room, named it after a racetrack, put the racetrack signs on it. We have gifts we give. Sometimes visitors, where our whole our entire employees will sign uh, race tires. Uh, our employees took it upon themselves to take pictures of all the employees and, and make um, uh, displays of them. We started committees. This is our recognition pyramid. We started to do our, our continuous skills development. So all, all this plan optimization type structures, disciplines, we felt that hitting the culture first gave us the right to move on to other things. It enabled us to move rapidly once we got a trust built in our organization. Um, we have we have won a world class award in this Target Zero Award for uh, closed loop system. So I told you there was a lot of fights in our safety meetings at the beginning of my the journey there. It, it was almost as simple as put a closed loop system in. Any ideas that were gathered were put on the board, and they didn't leave that board until they were resolved. So it took away a lot of fights because people can't say anymore, well, we've been telling manager about this for 22 years, you didn't do any lockout tag, you got enough, just take, starts taking it away. So, so the value of the tools is, is to create a structure and accountability, not for the employee, but for the managers. You know, if an area manager is running around the plant all day long and you're pointing to him and saying, I got a problem, and he's got other things on his mind. So you create these tools and, and you've got to convince your employees that no, I know you said it for 20 times, but now fill out a card. We'll get it done. So there's our uh, daily management system boards in, 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 our, in our center of excellence. This is our manufacturing area through the glass wall. So we continued with six S. We call it, you guys, you know, a lot of people call it 5S um, in daily equipment care. So what really happens? So you know, to get back to culture, you have to have an end game for the culture. It's just not to be a flowery culture thing. So our safety, we, we actually were battling for number one in the world at one point in our journey. Our safety improved. Um, I was walking one of our customers, it's a 75 year customer of Goodyear through and after we had started seeing dramatic improvements in our plan, he noticed this sign, this is a two-sided sign above a conveyor. <laughs> And his name just happened to be the same name as the company that you know was visiting. <laughs> so we use that as a, 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 an example of what we're not like anymore in the plant. But this had been missed. It was kind of up in the high part of the ceiling. Um, engagement dramatically increased in our plant. Waste dramatically increased in our plant. Quality PPMs improved dramatically. And our cumulative profits, this was I zeroed out for year one dramatically improved. So we, we, what transformed in, in the business? So we were asked to present the AME Awards this year in San Diego, and um, this is one of the charts I used. And so number one thing that transforms leadership. Leadership is 100% accountable. They're accountable for the behaviors of hourly, they're accountable for the behaviors within their own, their, themselves. Work environment change. You can't expect people to work in a terrible environment and then come back and say, hey, don't, you know, we want you to feel good about yourself. And then the employee engagement changed. So we went from the worst in the company to an AME award winner. Only, only business in Goodyear that's ever won an AME award. And our CEO had said at one time, um, why can't we have a business win the AME award? And five years later, we did. So what needs done when we talk about we already knew what needed done, we didn't need to consult, gee, we had to care, and we had to really care, and show we cared, and tell them we cared, and demonstrate in different ways that we cared. Safety, no bargaining, do what's right. Um, even though we're, we're dealing with bargaining units in uh, USW, set expectations, break rules, silly rules, like, uh, you know, 
It, just because you're allowed to swear doesn't mean that's the environment we're going to live in. Um, on, on some of those closed loop systems, the card things I talked about, um, like a, a rule that you don't have to put your name on a card, that's just a silly rule. Like, like to talk about that rule is silly. What am I going to do? Get a handwriting analysis on you and come get you? You know, it's like we just make rules and then we talk about them and then use them for reasons why we shouldn't do things that we that nobody should feel bad about doing. So after five years, we won the award. Um, you know, I talked about managers wouldn't even stand with me. To, uh, I, I accepted the award with um, the president of our union standing on stage, with the chairperson of our union on stage, and with our safety manager on stage. This is uh, an application. Part of the application you fill out for an AME award. There's 60 questions here. This is the evidence you provide. So as we started doing things and processes and, 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 um, and type of um, procedures in our plan, Communications. Uh, this was the end. This was stuff and results. So th th these are the. This was the nonverbal part of the application. You also had a kind of a letter that described what you did. So the guys that came into the in to give us the audit um, basically uh, wanted us to present in in San Diego, and they said what we want you to present is your pearl, and they said your pearl's culture. You have just dramatically changed this place. Major turnaround in management. So. Uh, that's us up on stage, uh, just to give you a glimpse. This is our union president, and uh, I don't think he's minding being up there at all. <laughs> he's made some magazines. And then they said, hey, we want you to talk about what was your biggest challenge? What's your biggest challenge to turn your company around like this? And we said, well, our biggest challenge was uh, building culture of trust. And they said, well, tell us why it was such a big challenge to build trust. Well, not just from where we came, but the fact is, if you want somebody to trust you, you want to have a trusting relationship with somebody, um, you've got to step out and put yourself into the glass house. Because you're saying, you're trying to commit to something that you're not even good enough to do yet. But over the years, you're, you're committing to, to it because you want to be that good. And your employees are going to help you get there if you put yourself out on the limb. Because they're going to be the first ones to point out what you said you, you, you were going to do. So it's not always comfortable, sometimes vulnerable. You pick your battles. It's not about who wins. It's all in counters matter. So I talked about that validating our salary model. So I took 660 questions. When, when I did the Culture 101, of course, I said, I've got to figure out a way to do a gap analysis on culture and understand culture. I said, yeah, we got this management model safety learning organization. But I said, how do I validate the model? So I went and talked to HR, and, and I was running the CI department at the time. I said, I want give me every handwritten comment every employee has ever talked to, told us about. Everyone that's ever been submitted on every employee, birthday survey, survey you know, of, of maturity of the business, round tables, every complaint ever written. And so they gave me about 660, so almost 700 comments. And I said, I'm going to take those comments, and I'm going to, I'm going to use them in our model and see, do they match the model? So lo and behold, as I built that thing, it was amazing. And so I'm showing this to our whole employee group that 104 comments said they want a high performance system. Saying, think of that, you got hourly union people telling you they want a high performance system. So as you go through the whole thing, 91 want respect and 87 want communication transparency, they built the model. Built the model, our employees all the way down to, they want to be treated like a person and actually have some fun. So the question became at the time of this was, why don't all companies, because I could take this model to your company, and I'll bet you 99.9% .9 I could match it up the same way. Because who doesn't want to be safe? Who doesn't want to be in a learning organization? Who doesn't want to be in this kind of culture? So the question became for our team, because I'm standing here with them just like I was standing here with you, we are a culture as we stand together. We are a culture. You can't deny it. You can't point to it and say it's something else. It's us right here. So how come if you want this, and I want this, and the managers want it, why don't we have a high performance, this great culture? If you read books, they'll tell you it's things like this because the CEO is too uh, egotistical to push and through. It's like, read it to us. That's a ridiculous comment. So my conclusion was this, because it's hard work. I have seen vice presidents, presidents, 
CEOs walk through plants that I was a director of manufacturing. I've seen CEOs come to my plant, walk through, see things they didn't like, and then come back and say, hey, nice job, good plant, right? It's hard work. It's like walking past your kids every time they don't make their bed, they don't say the right things, you know, they're, 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 they're doing the wrong things. And it's hard work to address that constantly, right? Sometimes you want to convince yourself, oh, they just go out about the same thing. Really? I've seen, I've seen it over and over. It is hard work. And that's where, the, that's where the buck is. It's hard work. And so we committed to the hard work. We committed to it and said, we know it's going to be hard. And it's hard to address the managers or, or the hourly people that don't do everything right. So excellence, uh, uh, Aristotle says excellence is an art won by training and habituation. So we're not, um, we are what we repeatedly do. If you walk through the plant every time and find something to improve, you will improve. If you walk through it and not find things to improve and, and ignore people, and the best systems you have in the plant are going to deteriorate. So, we actually had a person say they don't like swearing. And that was an hourly person in that comment. Now imagine that. They have a right, right to swear, but their own people who will like to swear and want to swear. Okay. Don't, uh, don't like it. So when you really talk about culture and freeing people up, freeing up their energies, not worrying about the environment, it, you got to neutralize it. You have to have this pure, clean environment. <laughs> Are the race winning certificates a new thing or a fairly new thing? You That's know, really cool. it's interesting. Uh, it was years before our time that they had done it before and let it fade out. And our employees brought it back and said, hey, you know, we used to give, those employees will take that certificate to a race. And, and, and so let's just say that, um, you know, Kozlowski or whoever the, yeah. you know, the driver was won the race, Truex, whatever. They'll take it to a race and try to get Truex to sign that certificate. They'll take their drag tires to the drag races and get the certificate to sign. So, and they created that on their own. They just like, so, this, so things just kind of have a tendency to, you know, good things seem to grow out of a lot of this. Okay. Yeah, I've got two questions. First of all, I enjoyed your talk very much. Thank you very much. So the first question is that if you're going to say to that workforce you're changing the culture, the opposite side is thinking we need to change management, that's why it's so bad. Absolutely. And so my question to you, my first question to you is how are you messaging culture? Because you're walking out there saying this needs to change, this needs to change. It sounds like a whole lot of criticism. Mm -hmm. right? So from their perspective, they're looking at you and thinking, well, if you hadn't underinvested, if you didn't give us clear direction, if you hadn't done all the basic management stuff, you need to change, but they can't say that because they work for you. So that's my first question. Well, okay, so so we actually, I would actually have conversations like with, I am with you and say to them, we realize that we, we have not been managing problems. We, 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 we put ourselves out there. And uh, I mean, it, it was even behind closed doors. So you can't be, you can't be just, hey, let's make sure all the people think we're really, we really care. It's behind closed doors. So when, when the, the, the director of operations come to my office late at night or at 7 o'clock, whatever, you know, Jim Mason, he's terrible. He's the union president. You know, we said, and he, we knew we were going to struggle with him because he was the hardest union president in, in the nation.